Come on up. Okay, church. Um, it's time for us to read scripture. I'd like to ask everyone to stand. And uh, it's my desire that these words would penetrate our hearts as we read. Um, Matthew 6, 5 through 12. And when you pray, do not pray the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corner to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have not received the reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we for, who have forgiven our debtors. Amen. 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 Good morning, church. It's always wonderful to see that between the moments of 1015 and 1045, there are many who arrive. It, is, it, it does my heart good to know that... Uh, there are those who struggled, struggled, I tell you, struggled with the desire to get up and go to church, and then gave in and said, okay, I'll go. Yesterday, I wasn't feeling well, and my wife kept saying to me, are you going to get someone else to preach? And I made a decision, like you made a decision this morning. I made a decision that God was going to have me in good shape in order to stand up here and do my bit so, thank God, he came through. And as I was reading that scripture that you just read with us, which Brett, who is our worship coordinator person for Fourth Sabbath, and also for our whole worship committee, he has decided that on the Fourth Sabbath, we should have a little different way of doing scripture. So I hope you like being in a congregation and, and feeling like you're part of a congregation, not only for singing but then also for reading scripture together because I'm going to tell you that in that moment, just a moment ago, I realized what God was saying and how well it fits with what we're going to look at in just a few moments. The fact is, our Father knows what we need. Didn't we just read that? What? Before we ask. Now, I, I, I can sit down right now if you promise that you understand that. Oh, you don't understand? Okay, well then I will, I'll, I'll, I'll direct your attention to what God has asked me to say to you today, and that is that we're journeying with Jesus this last few weeks, and we're pretending, well, I hope we're not pretending, I hope we are really, really positively deciding that we're going to be his disciples Okay, We're deciding to be his disciples and that we're allowing him to be our rabbi. Okay, This is just the Hebrew word for teacher. And so in this situation where we find in Matthew 6, remember Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are the, the big sermon that Jesus preaches at the beginning of his time and he does so in order to let people know what it is that he is going to be telling them at the beginning and then also at the middle and also at the end of his time here on earth. Because you see, Jesus is God's communication strategy. I was with the pastors this week and I'm discovering that maybe I ate something at that meal that didn't agree with me, which is what kind of took me down yesterday. And I just want you to know that as we reported to each other some of the things that are going on in the churches in this 
region of the Southern California Conference. Because those of you who don't know, this is a unique conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in North America in that we have five regions. And our region is the West region. And it was reported that there are people who have problems with the Trinity and that concept. And I want you to know that I'm okay with discussing these kinds of things because of what I just said to you. So I'm going to say it again. Jesus is God's communication strategy. Now, that may sound like I'm not talking about a person. So forgive me if you feel that he needs to be more of a person. But I'm going to connect him to the fact that the words of Scripture, which God spoke to his prophets and to his leaders like Moses, whose book we are going to read in a moment, are also the word of God, which is a communication to humanity. So if, if you can just hang with that idea for a moment and realize that we are dealing with, we have prayed to, we have sung to the God of the universe who we believe made us and who loves us and who wants to have a relationship with us but has to communicate with us in ways that we will understand, then you might be able to catch a hold of why when somebody comes to me and says, oh, I don't believe this or I don't believe that about the Trinity, I say, you know what? It's a very complicated issue. And I don't think that we even have enough brain power on earth to really understand it completely. So please understand that God is trying very hard to relate himself to his creatures known as humans. And he does so first by visions and spoken word. And then, as John tells us in the very first chapter of his book, John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So God, so again, I'm going to say my, my sentence at the beginning of this time together this morning is that Jesus is God's communication strategy to humanity. He is the blessed Son of God. He is the incarnate one. Again, raise your hand or just a finger if you, if you know what the word carne means. Okay? All right. Yes, thank you, Eric. I know you know. It's easy for our Spanish-speaking brothers and sisters because they know that this is what they call meat. So we can say in English a better way of saying incarnate would be enfleshed. This is God in flesh. Jesus of Nazareth. He is a son. He's part of a family. He's son of Mary, son of Joseph. He was born into a family that was part of a people that had been specially chosen to live out a direct relationship with God. You want the big word? Okay, you asked for it. Theocracy. Okay, you, you know that we live in a democracy, but the people of Israel before King Saul, lived in a theocracy where they had a prophet who they could go and ask questions of, and he would ask God, and then God would tell the prophet, and then the prophet would tell the person who asked the question. Or you would go to the priest, and the priest would have this, this plate on his chest with 12 stones, one representing each of the of the, 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 the tribes of the family, and then two on the top, the Urim and the Thummim, and then you'd ask God a yes-no question, and either one stone would light up or the other stone would light up. I mean, this was amazing. You could ask the God of the universe direct questions, 
and you could get direct questions back. This was a special, a very special people that had a special relationship. Not all, not that all humanity, even today, cannot participate in this kind of relationship, because as you know, uh, we, we believe that you can get on your knees and you can pray to God right now and that he will answer you. We believe that, but some of us wonder whether or not God still speaks. There was a special call that happened. Abram, Abram, notice I didn't say Abraham. Abram said yes. Abram said yes to the call, and a line uh, of a family was started. And even though slavery was a part of this, this history, so, so was redemption. These are, these are big words. Um, slavery, oh my goodness. 400, 430 years. And it was even prophesied that it would happen, that they would go into slavery for 130 years. Can you imagine being in the mud pits in Egypt, building the, the pyramids for the Egyptians and wondering when the redemption would come and then dying, not seeing that redemption? I don't know about you, but... I, I am one of those Adventists <laughs> whose father and grandfather have gone to their graves believing that Jesus would come sooner than he has. Having worked all of their lives preaching that Jesus was coming soon only to be cut down, in my grandfather's case, on his way to preach on a Sabbath morning when a young lady was adjusting her seat on the other side of the road, lost control of her big 70s car, and slammed into his full-sized American sedan and killed him instantly. The subject of his sermon? The second coming. My father preached that sermon at his funeral. And then my father, <laughs> he, he's, well, now let me tell you, I stand before you older than my father was when he died. Let me tell you, 53 for me was a strange year because I realized just how hale and hearty my father felt, only to start having headaches and then being the, the immigrant that he was to America, didn't listen to his doctor who told him to go and get an MRI. Not that it would have done any good. But he, he didn't want to do this. this. This is just those American doctors trying to spend your money. Such an immigrant mentality. But that, that cancer took him. Took him at, at 53, still thinking, still preaching that Jesus was coming soon. So can you imagine that in this line, in this special family, you have people who are believing that a deliverer would come? And they believed that for 430 years. Well, little did they know that that deliverer had actually already been born, killed a man, and then ran away. Now, now are you maybe feeling a little bit like God, looking down on his special people and saying, oh my goodness, I'm just trying to communicate to them how much I love them and that I will deliver them and that I will take care of them, but they are not cooperating they don't understand. 
Jesus, God, redeemed his people from the land of slavery in Egypt. And he planted them in a land that he had set apart from them. And I want you to keep those two lands in your mind as we go forward here, you see, because they represent two different worlds even, if you like. One is a world of slavery. One is a world of oppression. One is a world where you are not free. And one is a world that has been given to you by God, has, has changed your, your future. It's, it's known as the beautiful land. Sung, songs sung might, might have even called it Beulah, Beulah land. In this beautiful land, these chosen people, these special people with, with, uh, with their special direct relationship with God were supposed to live in a way that was different to the nations around them. Now, how is it supposed to be different? Today we're talking about forgiveness, debts, and debtors. So I'd like you to turn in your Bibles if you don't have one there could be one near you in a pew, or maybe you have it on your phone. I, I pray to God that you have it on your phone, because when you need it, you might as well have it right at hand, like Google is right there. So break out your phones and look up Deuteronomy chapter 15. Um, you can download an app even in the time that I'm speaking, I'm sure. Uh, and Deuteronomy chapter 15 begins by talking about a year, the, the year, not a year, but the year of canceling debts. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, uh, what is this? Uh, well, here we go. This is part of the prayer that our rabbi teaches us to pray. The year of canceling debts. Let's look at it. Number one, it's within the family. There are some specific instructions which I actually find interesting because I would love to think that this is how we could treat all of humanity. But these are instructions that are being given to specifically deal with people within the family. So if you would like to define your family as the human family, I bless you. If you would like to define your family as the Adventist family, I bless you. It's a smaller family, <laughs> believe me, it's a very much smaller family. However, the part of Deuteronomy 15 that I want you to hear is maybe a big part. It says, at the end of every seven years, this is verse 1, you must cancel debts. So remember, this is in the family. This is how it is to be done. Here, here's now the instructions. Ready? Every creditor shall cancel the loan he has made to his fellow Israelite. Okay, so it's not something in some respects that you do with people who don't understand. That's what I'm going to take from the idea that you're not doing this. The word that you'll see further down in, in 15 here is alien, meaning uh, uh, not Israelite. I'm glad that the NIV uses a nicer term because basically uh, uh, you could say Israelite and not Israelite or Gentile. Okay, some of you know that I have scrubbed the word non-Adventist out of my dictionary. Okay, because it's, it's like this club that we grew up with that you were either in or you were not in, okay? When really, Adventist with a small a, not a big a, that's the noun, proper, proper noun, a name. Adventist with a small a can be referring to anybody who is looking forward to the coming of the king. You can be an Adventist person. You can be oriented towards the coming of the king and, and, and knowing that he has promised he will come back, but that we are still living in this land of slavery. Remember, land of slavery, 
beautiful land. This is what we're talking about today. So now that you're in the beautiful land, this is Deuteronomy, now that you're in the beautiful land or you're living in this new economy, let me use that term because I'll refer to it again, Every creditor shall cancel the loan he has made with his fellow Israelite. He shall not require payment from his fellow Israelite or brother because the Lord's time, the Lord's, okay, so the boss man, the one who makes the rules, the one who sets the economy, it's the Lord's time for canceling debts has been proclaimed. When should we do this? If we're living in the new beautiful land and we're living according to the uh, economic uh, uh, distribution of the king of the universe who has this special direct relationship with his chosen people, what? We should cancel it every seven years. You may require payment from a foreigner. A foreigner. Isn't that interesting? So I'm just going to say the foreigner is somebody who doesn't understand your economic system, somebody who doesn't recognize the Lord. Okay? But you must cancel any debt your brother owes you. However, there should be... Okay, so here, here, comes, here comes a statement which just absolutely blows me away. I, I, I don't know how you read this, but it's pretty straightforward here. However, there should be no poor among you. For in the land, remember, slavery, beautiful land, in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance, he will richly bless you. If you fully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow all these commands I'm giving you today, the key to understanding this is number one it's not your land it's not your resources this is not your sustenance I believe it's the pivotal point of this entire chapter this entire idea of debts and debt cancellation is that it is God's riches and God's generosity I love that word, and I'm trying to use it more and more in my life. I'm trying to actually be more and more like that word. I want that word to be what people think of when they think about me. I want them to think that I am generous. Guess what? How does, how does God do that? How's he doing that today? What does the Bible say? He sends the sun and the what are we getting a few sprinkles of today? Rain. And, and he just sends it on the good people, right? They, they're the ones who get their lawns watered today. But if you're a sinner man, you don't get your lawn watered. No. He sends the sun and the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous, the Bible says. This is his version of generosity. So if you're listening this morning and you're realizing that you are part of the special people that are being talked about here, then understand that he's talking with you and he is saying, be generous like I am generous. And he uses a word, I don't know what your version says, but uh, in verse 8, well, verse 8 comes after verse 7. And in verse 7 are some very harsh words. Hard-hearted and tight-fisted. Now, I don't know if those are words that, that you appreciate, but I do know that there are whole corporations in the world that value those words. In fact, there are whole economies that value those words. They don't care. I, I, I like to say things like this. Uh, some of you know the group U2, and you know the lead singer, Bono. So you know that when he goes and talks to people at the United Nations, people know him too. And when he talks to them about 
debt forgiveness for entire nations in this world that will never ever be able to pay back their debt that he's actually talking in biblical terms. He's coming to the International Monetary Fund or he's coming to the United Nations and saying to humanity in this world today, what if we just forgave this national debt and let them have a clean slate and start again? I want you to know that there are, there are countries around the world that are actually trying this. Countries that you wouldn't expect because maybe they were under communism well, maybe that was the reason why. I've heard Latvia has forgiven millions of dollars of debt in order to stoke their economy so that people are not weighed down and pressed down by debt. So when we hear words in, in verse 8 like open-handed, an open-handed attitude, not, a, not, a, not with a grudging heart, then I, I, I have to ask myself questions like, well, if, if I do have a, a grudging heart, if I really don't want to forgive, what's the problem? And I, I've thought about this several times, and it came back to me as I was preparing to tell you this this morning, and so I'm impressed to tell you that the reason that we are not open-handed with our brothers and sisters in a myriad of different ways is because we're in fear. We are in fear that we will not have enough. Scarcity is the word. I don't know if you've heard that one, but there are those of us who are talking about it quite a bit these days. The fear of scarcity, well, quite honestly, it's what drives our markets, doesn't it? What happened in the Middle East recently that maybe has cost us at the gas pump? Okay, a little explosion or two over in the Middle East, and suddenly our gas prices go up. The fear of scarcity. Okay, um, how, come, how come that diamond that you gave to your, your darling when you asked her to marry you, how come it costs so much? It's the belief that it's very scarce, that there are only just a few. And so because there are just a few, we're going to make you pay a lot of money for the one that you get. What if I had to tell you that there are probably more diamonds in the world than rubies? And that there is a false sense of scarcity that has been created by the diamond collectives in Antwerp, Belgium. Some of which are fellow South Africans like me who dug those diamonds out of the ground in South Africa and are just keeping them safe to give you the illusion that they are scarce, to keep the price up because they are scarce. But that actually there are fewer rubies in the world, which we call what? Semi-precious. Oh, no, not precious. Semi-precious. Who said? Who decided that? You see? So this idea of fear and the fear of scarcity is what this chapter is, 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 is battling against, basically. It's saying, if you're part of the special people of God, if you're part of those that live in the beautiful land, the land where God's economy, where God's direct intervention with humanity exists in the minds and hearts of the people, then you really can't have this idea of fear of scarcity. Because you will believe that God will provide. 
I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe this is a new idea. But it is something that I think drives a lot of us. Example. Elijah is on the run from Ahab. He no longer is being fed by ravens, by the way, a very cool thing. You think, oh my goodness, the last time I saw a raven eating, he was eating out of the trash. Yes. Yes, they're very smart, and, and they do. They make a mess of our trash cans in Santa Clarita. And they, we've tried. Uh, believe me, the, the designers of the trash cans in Santa Clarita have put a lid on the top that's pretty heavy, but uh, they get a little hand from those who are trying to get bottles, and they leave the lids off, and then you see the birds going into the trash cans and pulling out the burger boxes. And they pull the burger boxes over, and they know how to open the burger boxes, and you see the ravens eating out of the burger boxes. That's so cool. I think this is recycling in our community. It's so wonderful, except then they leave the burger box, and it looks like the place is trashy, because they don't put the burger box back in the trash. He had been fed by ravens at the brook Cherith, and this was now dried up, and so he didn't have a water source, so God tells him to go outside of the country that was being punished. He was going outside of the country to Zarephath, and he gets to Zarephath, and there in Zarephath, he meets a lady outside of the town. She's picking up a few sticks, and he, he, he talks to her, which is kind of strange, because men were not supposed to talk to women directly. They were supposed to talk to their husband, but he talks to her, and he asks her where, what she's doing. And she is very forthright with him because the famine had reached their part of the world as well. And she says, I am picking up sticks to make a fire to cook a last meal for my son and myself. So she's not only in trouble with food, but she's also a widow. And she's also got a child dependent. So this is a woman who you would say needs help. So it is absolutely crazy that Elijah says the next thing to her. Look, if you will make a meal for me first, I promise you in the name of the God of heaven that you will never go hungry. What if God had to say that to you? You're down to your last nickel. And he says, give me your nickel. And I will make sure that you have gas in your tank, that you have a job, that you have a roof over your head. What? What? Really? Sounds impossible because it was it, impossible by human standards. And so she takes a leap of faith, my friends. She takes this leap of faith into God's economy. She makes a meal. She puts the cake in front of Elijah. Elijah eats it down. It's all gone. She hasn't had a thing. And then she goes back to the, the old word is meal, okay, flour. She goes back to the flour jar that she has just emptied into her mixing bowl and she pours it into the mixing bowl again and there is flour where there wasn't flour before. And so it happened every day until Elijah left and the famine was over. My friends, it's a choice, it's a choice that we make but some of us believe, I must keep what I have. Some assumptions for those of you who believe that. First of all, if you believe that you must keep what you have, it's because you assume that you have provided it for yourself and that therefore it's yours. You are assuming that it is your strength, your intellect, your connections, your job that has given you what you have. How about 
It's my land. Well, is that what the text is saying? Is that what this is pointing towards? Remember, they were slaves in a land that was not theirs. They were oppressed. They were killed like cattle fodder. And then they were rescued out of that, and they were placed in a beautiful land. And in that beautiful land, they were told, every seven years, you are to cancel all the debts. You are to live. He, God was basically saying, you are to live with an attitude of abundance, an attitude of generosity. Why? Because you now live in the land where God is king, where the one who provides will provide for everything that you need. Therefore, when your brother comes to you and borrows, this is what it says later on, do not be tight-fisted. Tight-fisted with what? Tight-fisted with God's stuff that he gave you. Be open-handed. Why? Because you're not afraid that you won't have enough. Do you see the logic? If I'm connected, if I'm connected to the God of the universe who provides, who will never let me down, who will give me life, albeit the life that he wants, now that's the, that, that's the catch sometimes. Because sometimes we want a life that may not match up with the life that he's willing to give us. And we might be angry with him for that. I wanted this. And God says, no, you don't need that. Okay, so just, just know that I understand that. But I am telling you that God will provide. He will keep you alive for as long as he wishes to keep you alive. This is what I prayed when my father was ill. Lord, if you have anything more for my father to do, please keep him alive. The answer was, I don't have anything more for him to do in this life. You'll see him in the next. So if we are in that mentality, that direct connection with God that says, I trust you, God, you are the one who provides, then I can be generous, I can be open-handed with my fellow humans because I know that when I have given till I don't have anything left, or at least anything that I can see that I have left, that he is going to provide in ways that I have absolutely no idea that he could have or would have provided. And believe me, this is not a sermon that says, okay, you should give it to the church. Or, okay, you should... No, I'm just saying, be connected to the God who is love. Because, my friends, it's different to fear. The chosen family, you see, is invited and, I believe, commanded to spin the economic wheel God's way. Recognizing God's generosity and, 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 and constant provision. And that this would, be, this would be played out, you see, this would be played out in the life of his special people. I think that's why he chose a special people. Don't you? I mean, he could have chosen everybody, but he chooses this one special family, and then he says, please live this way and show the rest of the human family what it is like to have a direct relationship with God where you trust him to provide. As God blesses, so we can bless. He has limitless blessing so we can have an open-handed attitude. The text today in the disciples' prayer is forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Jesus also said, if you want God's forgiveness, go first and make things right with your brother or sister. You see, as we forgive, remember we're talking in Deuteronomy 15, we're talking about the forgiveness of debts. As we forgive the debts that others owe us because we're living in this love relationship with our Heavenly Father and we're, we're not 
afraid. We're not living in scarcity. We're living in generosity. Then we can forgive others what they owe us. Deuteronomy tells us that God will bless us according to his promise, according to his economic plan for his special family. So yeah, you want to say that you're part of his special family here on earth? Then you are part of those who can live with a generous God and therefore you too can be generous and you too can give and forgive. To me, that's endless blessing. Because God, God, is, God is endless. There's, there's no end to him. He's the, he's the Alpha and the Omega. He, there's no end to his goodness. That's eternal life. I, I believe it's amazing. In God's family, in God's economy, we can afford, I believe, to be generous. And here's, here's the phrase you can take home. Because we're taking it out of his pocketbook. Okay, you can afford to be generous when you when you take it out of his pocketbook, right? And let me ask you, does his pocketbook have a bottom? No. See, so why should we worry? Why should we why should we be so scared? Except if we're thinking it's us. You see? When you think that it's you, then the pocketbook is as deep as you are. But when you are being generous and you're being generous with what God has given you and you say, well, God, look, I need to be generous with this person and I don't have it. He says, okay, here it is. And he's generous with you and then you can be generous. So when he says to us, forgive us, when we say forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, we are saying we buy into God's economy. We buy into God's economy. Forgive us for being tight-fisted with anything, with anything that is us. Maybe you get worried about your stuff. Maybe you get worried about your, your connections, you know, at work. You're, you're worried about how things are going and, and whether or not you're going to make that next elevation in your work situation. You're worried about your connections and you're worried that somebody's going to pip, pip you into that spot. Maybe, maybe somebody has said something evil about you. You're worried about your reputation. Have you ever thought that that's part of who you are and, and, and your reputation? You can actually, my friends, you can actually be generous with your reputation. You ever thought of that? By you coming alongside some other person, you share your reputation with them. Others see that person differently because you decide to be their friend. Ever thought of that? You can be generous with your reputation. Or not. Or not. You can be generous with your your concern. Or not. So I say, may we, instead of of living tight-fisted and not being willing to, to let go the things we believe others owe us, Let's let's buy into God's economy. Let's buy into the fact that he has called us even now to live in this beautiful land. Now, we're not there yet, okay? Physically, we're not there yet. But he has promised that even though we walk through this piece of the valley of the shadow of death, he is going to walk with us and he is going to be our shepherd and he is going to feed us, he's going to water us and he's going to protect us and bless us. And I don't know about you, but I believe there's lots and lots of people out there, friends of mine, who need to hear this because it's really good news. 
Because they're not living in this land with us mentally. They are not bought into this idea of generosity. They're still living in scarcity. They're still living in slavery. I told you this last week, but I think the whole, the whole ad agency in the world, what are they trying to make us feel like? <laughs> you're, not, you're not cool unless you, you know, give all those clothes away and wear these. Okay? Fear! Fear, that's what they want to make. They want to make you feel like you're not cool. Well, I'm, I'm here to tell you, if you want to live in love, if you want to live in the land of love, the land where God of the universe is king of your life, king of the economy, is generous, then, my friends, make the choice today to accept his leadership in your life. And live the generous life. Forgive and be forgiven. Amen.